The Pilgrim's Progress, Part Two, Chapter Eight. The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part Two, Chapter Eight. The Delectable Mountains and the Shepherds. I saw now that they went on till they came at the river that was on this side of the Delectable Mountains, to the river where the fine trees grow on both sides, and whose leaves, if taken inwardly, are good against sickness where the meadows are green all the year long, and where they might lie down safely. By this riverside, in the meadow, there were coats and folds for sheep, the house built for the nourishing and bringing up of those lambs, the babes of those women that go on the pilgrimage. Also there was here one that was entrusted with them, who could have pity, and that could gather these lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and that could gently lead those that were with young. Now to the care of this man Christiana admonished her four daughters to commit their little ones, that by these waters they might be housed, cared for, helped, and nourished, and that none of them might be lacking in time to come. This man, if any of them go astray or be lost, he will bring them again. He will also bind up that which was broken, and will strengthen them that are sick. Here they will never want food and drink and clothing, here they will be kept from thieves and robbers, for this man will die before one of those committed to his trust shall be lost. Besides, here they shall be sure to have good nurture and training, and shall be taught to walk in right paths, and that, you know, is a favor of no small account. Also here, as you see, are delicate waters, pleasant meadows, dainty flowers, variety of trees, and such as bear wholesome fruit, fruit not like that that Matthew ate of, that fell over the wall out of Beelzebub's garden, but fruit that giveth health where there is none, and that continueth and increaseth it where it is. So they were content to commit their little ones to him, and that which was also an encouragement for them so to do was, for that all this was to be at the charge of the king, and so was as an hospital for young children and orphans. Now they went on, and when they were come to Bypath Meadow, to the stile over which Christian went with his fellow hopeful, when they were taken by giant despair, and put into Doubting Castle, they sat down, and consulted what was best to be done. To wit, now they were so strong, and had got such a man as great heart for their conductor, whether they had not best make an attempt upon the giant, demolish his castle, and, if there were any pilgrims in it, to set them at liberty, before they went any farther. So one said one thing, and another said the contrary. One questioned if it were lawful to go upon ground that was not the king's. Another said they might, providing their end was good. But Mr. Greatheart said, Though that reason given last cannot be always true, yet I have a commandment to resist sin, to overcome evil, to fight the good fight of faith, and I pray with whom should I fight this good fight, if not with giant despair? I will therefore attempt the taking away of his life, and the demolishing of Doubting Castle. Then said he, Who will go with me? Then said Old Honest, I will. And so will we, too. Said Christiana's four sons, Matthew, Samuel, Joseph, and James, for they were young men and strong. So they left the women in the road, and with them Mr. Feeble and Mr. Ready to halt with his crutches, to be their guard until they came back. For in that place, though giant despair dwelt so near, they, keeping in the road, a little child might lead them. So Mr. Greatheart, Old Honest, and the four young men went to go up to Doubting Castle to look for giant despair. When they came at the castle gate, they knocked for entrance with an unusual noise. At that the old giant comes to the gate, and diffidence his wife follows. Then said he, Who, and what is he, that is so hardy as after this manner, to disturb the giant despair? Mr. Greatheart replied, It is I, Greatheart, one of the king of the celestial country's conductors of pilgrims to their place, and I demand of thee that thou open thy gates for my entrance. Prepare thyself also to fight, for I am come to take away thy head, and to demolish Doubting Castle. Now Giant Despair, because he was a giant, 
thought no man could overcome him, and again thought he, <laughs> Since heretofore I have made a conquest of angels, shall Greatheart make me afraid? So he harnessed himself with his armor and went out. He had a cap of steel upon his head, a breastplate of fire girded to him, and he came out in iron shoes with a great club in his hand. Then these six men made up to him, and beset him behind and before. Also, when Diffidence, the giantess, came up to help him, old Mr. Honest cut her down at one blow. Then they fought for their lives, and Giant Despair was brought down to the ground, but was very loath to die. He struggled hard, and had, as they say, as many lives as a cat. But Great Heart was his death for he left him not till he had severed his head from his shoulders. Then they fell to demolishing Doubting Castle, and that, you know, might with ease be done, since Giant Despair was dead. They were seven days in destroying of that, and in it, of pilgrims, they found one, Mr. Despondency, almost starved to death, and one much afraid, his daughter. These two they saved alive, but it would have made you wonder to have seen the dead bodies that lay here and there in the castle-yard, and how full of dead men's bones the dungeon was. When Mr. Greatheart and his companions had performed this great work, they took Mr. Despondency and his daughter much afraid into their care, for they were honest people, though they were prisoners in Doubting Castle to that tyrant, Giant Despair. They therefore, I say, took with them the head of the giant, for his body they had buried under a heap of stones, and down to the road and to their companions they came, and showed them what they had done. Now, when the feeble mind and ready to halt saw that it was the head of giant despair indeed, they were very jocund and merry. Now Christiana, if need was, could play upon the vial, and her daughter Mercy upon the lute. So, since they were so merry disposed, she played them a lesson, and ready to halt would dance. So he took Despondency's daughter much afraid by the hand, and to dancing they went in the road. True, he could not dance without one crutch in his hand, but I promise you he footed it well. Also the girl was to be commended, for she answered the music handsomely. As for Mr. Despondency, the music was not so much to him. He was for feeding rather than dancing, for that he was almost starved. So Christiana gave him some of her bottle of spirits for present relief, and then prepared him something to eat, and in a little time the old gentleman came to himself, and began to feel finely revived. Now I saw in my dream, when all these things were finished, Mr. Greatheart took the head of giant despair, and set it upon a pole by the highway side, right over against the pillar that Christian erected for a caution to pilgrims that came after, to take heed of entering into his grounds. Then he writ under it, upon a marble stone, these verses following. This is the head of him whose name only in former times did pilgrims terrify, his castles down, and diffidence his wife, brave Mr. Greatheart, has bereft of life. Despondency, his daughter much afraid, great heart for them also the man has played. Who hereof doubts, if he'll but cast his eye up hither, may his scruples satisfy. This head also, when doubting cripples dance, doth show from fears they have deliverance. When these men had thus bravely showed themselves against doubting castle, and had slain giant despair, they went forward, and went on, till they came to the delectable mountains, where Christian and Hopeful refreshed themselves with the varieties of the place. They also acquainted themselves with the shepherds there, who welcomed them, as they had done Christian before, on to the delectable mountains. Now the shepherds, seeing so great a train, follow Mr. Greatheart, for with him they were well acquainted, they said unto him, Good sir, you have got a goodly company here. Pray, where did you find all these? Then Mr. Greatheart replied, First, here is Christiana and her train, her sons and her sons' wives, who, like the wain, keep by the pole, and do by compass steer from sin to grace, else they had not been here. Next, here's old Honest, come on pilgrimage, ready to halt, too. 
who I dare engage, true-hearted is, and so is feeble mind, who willing was not to be left behind. Despondency, good man, is coming after, and so also is much afraid, his daughter. May we have entertainment here, or must we farther go? Let's know whereon to trust. Then said the shepherds, This is a comfortable company. You are welcome to us, for we have a care for the feeble as well as for the strong. Our prince has an eye to what is done, to the least of these. Therefore weakness must not be a block to our entertainment. So they had them to the palace door, and then said unto them, Come in, Mr. Feeble Mind. Come in, Mr. Ready to Halt. Come in, Mr. Despondency, and Mrs. Much Afraid, his daughter. These, Mr. Great Heart, said the shepherds to the guide, we call him by name, for that they are most subject to draw back. But as for you and the rest that are strong, we leave you to your wonted liberty. Then said Mr. Greatheart, This day I see that grace doth shine in your faces, and that you are my lord's shepherds indeed, for that you have not pushed these helpless ones, neither with side nor shoulder, but have rather strewed their way into the palace with flowers, as you should. So the feeble and weak went in, and Mr. Greatheart and the rest did follow. When they were also sat down, the shepherd said to those of the weaker sort, what is it that you would have? For, said they, all things must be managed here for the supporting of the weak, as well as the warning of the unruly. So they made them a feast of things easy of digestion, and that were pleasant to the palates and nourishing. The which, when they had received, they went to their rest, each one separately unto his proper place. When the morning was come, because the mountains were nigh and the day clear, and because it was the custom of the shepherds to show the pilgrims before their departure some rarities, therefore, after they were ready and had refreshed themselves, the shepherds took them out into the fields and showed them first what they had showed to Christian before. Then they had them to some new places. The first was Mount Marvel, where they looked and beheld a man at a distance that tumbled the hills about with words. Then they asked the shepherds what that should mean. So they told them that the man was the son of Mr. Great Grace, of whom you read in the first part of the records of the Pilgrim's Progress, and he is set down there to teach the pilgrims how to behave, or to tumble out of their ways what difficulties they should meet with by faith. Then said Mr. Greatheart, I know him. He is a man above many. Then they had them to another place, called Mount Innocent, and here they saw a man clothed all in white, and two men, prejudice and ill-will, continually casting dirt upon them. Now, behold, the dirt, whatsoever they cast at him, would in a little time fall off again, and his garment would look as clear as if no dirt had been cast thereat. Then said the pilgrims, What means this? The shepherds answered, This man is named Godly Man, and this garment is to show the innocency of his life. Now those that throw dirt at him are such as hate his well-doing, but as you see, the dirt will not stick upon his clothes. So it shall be with him that liveth truly innocently in the world. Whoever they be that would make such a men dirty, they labour all in vain. For God, by that a little time is spent, will cause that their innocence shall break forth as the light, and their righteousness as the noonday. Then they took them and had them to Mount Charity, where they showed them a man that had a bundle of cloth lying before him, out of which he took coats and garments for the poor that stood about him. Yet his bundle or roll of cloth was never the less. Then said they, What should this be? This is, said the shepherds, to show you that he who has a heart to give off his labour to the poor shall never want wherewithal. He that watereth shall be watered himself, and the cake that the widow gave to the prophet 
did not cause that she had ever the less in her barrel. They had them also to a place where they saw one fool and one want wit washing of an Ethiopian, with intention to make him white. But the more they washed him, the blacker he was. Then they asked the shepherds what that should mean. So they told them, saying, Thus shall it be with the vile person. All means used to get such an one a good name shall, in the end, tend but to make him more abominable. Thus it was with the Pharisees, and so it shall be with all pretenders to religion. Then said Mercy, the wife of Matthew, to Christiana, her mother, Mother, I would, if it might be, see the hole in the hill, or that commonly called the byway to hell. So her mother break her mind to the shepherds. Then they went to the door, it was in the side of a hill, and they opened it, and bid Mercy hearken a while. So she hearkened, and heard one saying, Cursed be my father, the holding of my feet, back from the way of peace and life. And another said, Oh, that I had been torn in pieces before I had, to save my life, lost my soul. And another said, If I were to live again, how I would deny myself, rather than come to this place. Then there was as if the very earth groaned and quaked under the feet of this young woman for fear, so she looked white, and came trembling away, saying, Blessed be he and she that are delivered from this place. Now, when the shepherds had shown them all these things, they had them back to the palace, and entertained them with what the house would afford. But Mercy longed for something that she saw there, but was ashamed to ask. Her mother-in-law then asked her what she ailed, for she looked as one not well. Then said Mercy, There is a looking-glass hangs up in the dining-room, off of which I cannot take my mind. If, therefore, I have it not, I think I shall be unhappy. Then said her mother, I will mention thy wants to the shepherds, and they will not deny it thee. But she said, I am ashamed that these men should know that I longed. Nay, my daughter, said she. It is no shame but a virtue to long for such a thing as that. So Mercy said, Then, mother, if you please, ask the shepherds if they are willing to sell it. Now, the glass was one of a thousand. They would present a man one way with his own features exactly, and turn it but another way, and it would show one the very face and likeness of the prince of pilgrims himself. Yea, I have talked with them that can tell, and they have said that they have seen the very crown of thorns upon his head by looking in that glass. They have therein also seen the holes in his hands, in his feet, and in his side. Yea, such an excellency is there in this glass, that it will show him to one where they have a mind to see him, whether living or dead, whether in earth or in heaven, whether in a state of loneliness or in his kingliness, whether coming to suffer or coming to reign. Christiana, therefore, went to the shepherds apart. Now the names of the shepherds were Knowledge, Experience, Watchful, and Sincere, and said unto them, There is one of my daughters, that I think doth long for something that she hath seen in this house, and she thinks that she shall be unhappy if she should by you be denied. Call her, call her. She shall assuredly have what we can help her to. So they called her, and said to her, Mercy, what is that thing thou wouldst have? Then she blushed, and said, The great glass that hangs up in the dining-room. So Sincere ran and fetched it, and with a joyful consent it was given her. Then she bowed her head, and gave thanks, and said, By this I know that I have obtained favour in your eyes. They also gave to the other young women such things as they desired, and to their husbands, Great praise, for that they joined with great heart to the slaying of giant despair and the destroying of doubting castle. About Christiana's neck the shepherds put a necklace, and so they did about the necks of her four daughters. Also they put earrings in their ears, and jewels on their foreheads. When they were minded to go hence, they let them go in peace, but gave not to them those certain cautions which before were given to Christian and his companion. The reason was, for that these had great heart to be their guide, who was one that was well acquainted with things, and so could give them their cautions more seasonably. 
that is, even then when the danger was nigh the approaching. What cautions Christian and his companion had received of the shepherds, they had also lost by that the time was come that they need to put them in practice. Wherefore, here was the advantage that this company had over the other. From hence they went on singing, and they said, Behold, how fitly are the stages set, for their relief that pilgrims are become, and how they us receive without one let that make the other life our mark and home, what novelties they have to us they give, that we though pilgrims joyful lives may live, they do upon us too such things bestow that show we pilgrims are where'er we go. When they were gone from the shepherds, they quickly came to the place where Christian met with one turnaway, that dwelt in the town of apostasy. Wherefore of him Mr. Greatheart, their guide, did now put them in mind, saying, This is the place where Christian met with one turn away, who carried with him the character of his rebellion at his back. And this I have to say concerning this man, he would hearken to no counsel, but once falling, persuasion could not stop him. When he came to the place where the cross and the sepulchre were, he did meet with one that bid him look there, but he gnashed with his teeth, and stamped, and said he was resolved to go back to his own town. Before he came to the gate he met with Evangelist, who offered to lay hands on him, to turn him into the way again. But this turn away resisted him, and having done much harm unto him, he got away over the wall, and so escaped his hand. Then they went on, and just at the place where little faith formerly was robbed, there stood a man with his sword drawn, and his face all bloody. Then said Mr. Greatheart, Who art thou? The man made answer, saying, I am one whose name is Valiant for Truth. I am a pilgrim, and am going to the celestial city. Now, as I was in my way, there were three men did beset me, and propounded unto me these three things. One, whether I would become one of them. Two, or go back to the place from whence I came. Three, or die upon the place. To the first I answered, I had been a true man a long season, and therefore it could not be expected that I should now cast in my lot with thieves. Then they demanded what I should say to the second. So I told them that the place from whence I came, had I not found it unsatisfactory, I had not forsaken at all. But, finding it altogether unsuitable to me, and very unprofitable for me, I forsook it for this way. Then they asked me what I said to the third, and I told them, My life cost more dear far than that I should lightly give it away. Besides, you have nothing to do thus, to put things to my choice, wherefore at your peril be it if you meddle. Then these three, to wit, wild-head, inconsiderate, and pragmatic, drew their weapons upon me, and I also drew upon them. So we fell to it, one against three, for the space of above three hours. They have left upon me, as you see, some marks of their valour, and have also carried away with them some of mine. They are but just now gone. I suppose they might, as the saying is, hear your horse dash, and so they betook them to flight. But here was great odds, three against one. Tis true, but little or more are nothing to him that has the truth on his side. Though an host should encamp against me, said one, my heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Besides, said he, I have read in some records that one man has fought an army, 
And how many did Samson slay with the jawbone of an ass? Then said the guide, Why did you not cry out that some might have come in for your succor? So I did to my king, who I knew could hear me and afford invisible help, and that was sufficient for me. Then said Mr. Greatheart to Mr. Valiant for truth, Thou hast worthily behaved thyself. Let me see thy sword. So he showed it to him. When he had taken it in his hand, and looked thereon a while, he said, Ha! It is a right Jerusalem blade. It is so. Let a man have one of these blades, with a hand to wield it, and skill to use it, and he may venture upon an angel with it. He need not fear its holding, if he can but tell how to lay on. Its edges will never blunt. It will cut flesh and bones, and soul and spirit, and all. But you fought a great while. I wonder you were not weary. I fought till my sword did cleave to my hand, and when they were joined together, as if a sword grew out of my arm, and when the blood ran through my fingers, then I fought with most courage. Thou hast done well, thou hast resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Thou shalt abide by us, come in and go out with us, for we are thy companions. Then they took him, washed his wounds, and gave him of what they had to refresh him. And so they went on together. Now, as they went on, because Mr. Greatheart was delighted in him, for he loved one greatly that he found to be a man of his own sort, and because there were in company them that were feeble and weak, therefore he questioned with him about many things, as first what countryman he was. I am of dark land. For there I was born, and there my father and mother are still. Dark land, said the guide, doth not that lie upon the same coast with the city of destruction? Yes, it doth. Now, that which caused me to come on pilgrimage was this. We had one Mr. Telltrue come into our parts and he told it about what Christian had done, that went from the city of destruction, namely, how he had forsaken his wife and children, and had betaken himself to a pilgrim's life. It was also reported, and believed, how he had killed a serpent that did come out to resist him in his journey and how he got through to whither he intended. It was also told what welcome he had at all his lord's lodgings, specially when he came to the gates of the celestial city. For there, said the man, he was received with sound of trumpet by a company of shining ones. He told also how all the bells in the city did ring for joy at his entering in, and what golden garments he was clothed with, with many other things that now I shall forbear to relate. In a word, that man so told the story of Christian and his travels, that my heart fell into a burning haste to be gone after him, nor could father or mother stay me. So I got from them, and am come thus far on my way. You came in at the gate, did you not? Yes, yes, for the same man also told us that all would be nothing if we did not begin to enter this way at the gate. Look you, said the guide to Christiana. The pilgrimage of your husband, with what he has gotten thereby, is spread abroad far and near. Why is this Christian's wife? 
Yes, that it is, and these also are his four sons. What? And going on pilgrimage too? Yes, verily, they are following after. It glads me at heart. Good man, how joyful will he be when he shall see them that would not go with him, yet to enter after him in at the gates into the city. Without doubt it will be a comfort to him, for next to the joy of seeing himself there, it will be a joy to meet there his wife and children. But now you are upon that, pray let me hear your opinion about it. Some make a question whether we shall know one another when we are there. Do they think they shall know themselves then, or that they shall rejoice to see themselves in that happiness? And if they think they shall know and do this, why not know others and rejoice in their welfare also? Again, since relations are our second self, though that state will cease there, yet why may it not be wisely concluded that we shall be more glad to see them there than to see they are wanting? Well, I perceive whereabouts you are as to this. Have you any more things to ask me? about my beginning to come on pilgrimage. Yes. Were your father and mother willing that you should become a pilgrim? Oh, no. They used all means imaginable to persuade me to stay at home. Why? What could they say against it? They said it was an idle life, and if I myself were not inclined to sloth and laziness, I would never favour a pilgrim's condition. And what did they say else? Why, they told me that it was a dangerous way. Yea, the most dangerous way in the world, said they, is that which the pilgrims go. Did they show you wherein this way is so dangerous? Yes, and that in many particulars. Name some of them. They told me of the Slough of Despond, where Christian was well nigh smothered. They told me that there were archers standing ready in Beelzebub's castle to shoot them who should knock at the wicket gate for entrance. They told me also of the wood and dark mountains of the hill difficulty, of the lions and also of the three giants, Bloody Man, Maul, and Slaygood. They said, moreover, that there was a foul fiend haunted the Valley of Humiliation, and that Christian was by him almost bereft of life. Besides, said they, you must go over the Valley of the Shadow of Death, where the hobgoblins are, where the light is darkness, where the way is full of snares, pits, traps, and gins. They told me also of giant despair, of doubting castle, and of the ruin that the pilgrims met with there. Further, they said I must go over the enchanted ground, which was dangerous, and that... After all this, I should find a river, over which I should find no bridge, and that that river did lie betwixt me and the celestial country. And was this all? No, they also told me that this way was full of deceivers, and of persons that laid wait there to turn good men out of the path. But how did they make that out? They told me that Mr. Worldly Wise Man did lie there in wait to deceive. They also said that there were formality and hypocrisy continually on the road. They said also that Byens, Talkative, or Demas would go near to gather me up 
that the flatterer would catch me in his net, or that, with green-headed ignorance, I would presume to go on to the gate, from whence he was sent back to the hole that was in the side of the hill, and made to go the byway to hell. I promise you this was enough to discourage you, but did they make an end here? No stay. They told me also of many that had tried that way of old, and that had gone a great way therein, to see if they could find something of the glory there that so many had so much talked of from time to time, and how they came back again, and befooled themselves for setting a foot out of doors in that path, to the satisfaction of all the country, and they named several that did so, as obstinate and pliable, mistrust and timorous, turn away and old atheist, with several more who, they said, had some of them gone far to see what they could find, but not one of them found so much advantage by going as amounted to the weight of a feather. Said they anything more to discourage you? Yes, they told me of one Mr. Fearing, who was a pilgrim, and how he found this way so solitary that he never had a comfortable hour therein. Also that Mr. Despondency had like to have been starved therein. Yea, and also, which I had almost forgot, that Christian himself, about whom there had been such a noise, after all his ventures for a celestial crown, was certainly drowned in the black river, and never went a foot farther, however it was smothered up. And did none of these things discourage you? No. They seemed but as so many nothings to me. How came that about? Why, I still believed what Mr. Telltrue had said, and that carried me beyond them all. Then this was your victory, even your faith. It was so, I believed, and therefore came out, got into the way, fought all that set themselves against me, and, by believing, am come to this place. Who would true valour see, let him come hither. One here will constant be, come wind, come weather. There's no discouragement Shall make him once relent His first avowed intent To be a pilgrim Whoso beset him round With dismal stories do but themselves confound his strength the more is. No lion can him fright, he'll with a giant fight, but he will have a right to be a pilgrim. Hobgoblin nor foul fiend can daunt his spirit. He knows he at the end shall life inherit. Then fancies fly away. He'll fear not what men say. He'll labor night and day to be a pilgrim. 
End of Part 2, Chapter 8 The Pilgrim's Progress, Part 2, Chapter 9 The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, Part 2, Chapter 9 The Enchanted Ground By this time they were got to the enchanted ground, where the air naturally tended to make one drowsy, and that place was all grown over with briars and thorns, excepting here and there where there was an enchanted arbor, upon which, if a man sits, or in which, if a man sleeps, it is a question, some say, whether ever he shall rise or wake again in this world. Over this forest, therefore, they went, both one and another, and Mr. Greatheart went before, for that he was the guide, and Mr. Valiant for truth came behind, being rear-guard, for fear lest, peradventure, some fiend, or dragon, or giant, or thief, should fall upon their rear, and so do mischief. They went on here, each man with his sword drawn in his hand, for they knew it was a dangerous place. Also they cheered up one another as well as they could. Feeble mind Mr. Greatheart commanded should come up after him, and Mr. Despondency was under the eye of Mr. Valiant. Now they had not gone far, but a great mist and darkness fell upon them all, so that they could scarce, for a great while, see the one the other, wherefore they were forced for some time to feel for one another by words, for they walked not by sight. But any one must think that here was but sorry going for the best of them all, but how much worse for the women and children, who both of feet and heart were but tender. Yet so it was, that through the encouraging words of him that led in the front, they made a pretty good shift to wag along. The way also was here very wearisome through dirt and slabbiness, nor was there on all this ground so much as one inn or victualling house, therein to refresh the feebler sort. Here therefore was grunting and puffing and sighing, while one tumbleth over a brush, another sticks fast in the dirt, and the children, some of them, lost their shoes in the mire while one cries, I am down, and another, Ho, oh, where are you? and a third, The bushes have got such fast hold on me, I think I cannot get away from them. Then they came at an arbor, warm, and promising much refreshing to the pilgrims, for it was finely wrought above head, beautified with greens, furnished with benches and settles. It also had in it a soft couch, wherein the weary might lean. This, you must think, all things considered, was tempting, for the pilgrims already began to be foiled with the badness of the way, but there was not one of them that made so much as a motion to stop there. Yea, for aught I could perceive, they continually gave so good heed to the advice of their guide, and he did so faithfully tell them of dangers, and of the nature of dangers when they were at them, that usually, when they were nearest to them, they did most pluck up their spirits, and hearten one another to deny the flesh. This arbor was called the Slothful's Friend, on purpose, to allure, uh, if it might be, some of the pilgrims there to take up their rest when weary. I saw then, in my dream, that they went on in this their solitary ground, till they came to a place at which a man is apt to lose his way. Now, though when it was light their guide could well enough tell how to miss those ways that led wrong, yet in the dark he was put to a stand. But he had in his pocket a map of all ways leading to and from the celestial city. Wherefore he struck a light, for he also never goes without his tinder-box, and takes a view of his book or map which bids him be careful in that place to turn to the right-hand way. And had he not been careful to look in his map, they had, in all probability, been smothered in the mud, for just a little before them, and that at the end of the cleanest way, too, was a pit, none knows how deep, full of nothing but mud, there made on purpose to destroy the pilgrims in. Then thought I with myself, who that goeth on pilgrimage but would have one of those maps about him, that he may look, when he is at a stand, which is the way he must take. They went on then in this enchanted ground till they came to where was another arbor, and it was built by the highway side. And in that arbor there lay two men, whose names were Heedless and Too Bold. These two went thus far on pilgrimage, but here, being wearied with their journey, 
they sat down to rest themselves, and so fell fast asleep. When the pilgrims saw them, they stood still and shook their heads, for they knew that the sleepers were in a pitiful case. Then they consulted what to do, whether to go on and leave them in their sleep, or to step to them and try to awake them. So they concluded to go to them and wake them, that is, if they could. But with this caution, namely, to take heed that themselves did not sit down, nor embrace the offered benefit of that arbor. So they went in, and spake to the men, and called each one by his name, for the guide, it seems, did know them. But there was no voice or answer. Then the guide did shake them, and do what he could to disturb them. Then said one of them, I will pay you when I take my money. At which the guide shook his head. I will fight so long as I can hold my sword in my hand, said the other. At that one of the children laughed. Then said Christiana, What is the meaning of this? The guide said, They talk in their sleep. If you strike them, beat them, or whatever else you do to them, they will answer you after this fashion, or, as one of them said in old time, when the waves of the sea did beat upon them, and he slept as one upon the mast of a ship, when shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. You know, when men talk in their sleep, they say anything, but their words are not governed either by faith or reason. There is an unsuitableness in their words now, as there was before betwixt their going on pilgrimage and sitting down there. This, then, is the mischief of it. When heedless ones go on pilgrimage, tis twenty to one, but they are served thus. For this enchanted ground is one of the last refuges that the enemy to pilgrims has. Wherefore it is, as you see, placed almost at the end of the way, and so it standeth against us with the more advantage. For when, thinks the enemy, will these fools be so desirous to sit down as when they are weary? And when so like to be weary as when almost at their journey's end? Therefore it is, I say, that the enchanted ground is placed so near to the land of Beula, and so near the end of their race. Wherefore let pilgrims look to themselves, lest it happen to them, as it has done to these, that, as you see, are fallen asleep, and none can wake them. Then the pilgrims desired, with trembling, to go forward. Only they prayed their guide to strike a light, that they might go the rest of their way by the help of the light of a lantern. So he struck a light, and they went by the help of that through the rest of this way, though the darkness was very great. But the children began to be sorely weary, and they cried out to him that loveth pilgrims to make their way more comfortable. So by that they had gone a little farther, a wind arose that drove away the fog, so the air became more clear. Yet they were not off by much of the enchanted ground, only now they could see one another better, and the way wherein they should walk. Now, when they were almost at the end of this ground, they perceived that a little before them was a solemn noise, as of one that was much concerned. So they went on, and looked before them, and, behold, they saw, as they thought, a man upon his knees, with hands and eyes lift up, and speaking, as they thought, earnestly to one that was above. They drew nigh, but could not tell what he said. So they went softly till he had done. When he had done, he got up, and began to run towards the celestial city. Then Mr. Greatheart called after him, saying, So ho, friend, let us have your company, if you go, as I suppose you do, to the celestial city. So the man stopped, and they came up to him. But as soon as Mr. Honest saw him, he said, I know this man. Then said Mr. Valiant for truth, Prithee, who is it? It is one, said he, that comes from whereabout I dwelt. His name is Deadfast. He is certainly a right good pilgrim. So they came up one to another, and presently Standfast said to Old Honest, Who, hey, Father Honest, are you there? I, said he, that I am, as sure as you are there. Right glad am I, said Mr. Standfast, that I have found you on this road. And as glad am I, said the other, 
that I espied you upon your knees. Then Mr. Stanfast blushed, and said, But why, did you see me? Yes, that I did, quoth the other, and with my heart was glad at the sight. Why, what did you think? said Sandfast. Think? said Old Honest. What should I think? I thought we had an honest man upon the road, and therefore should have his company by and by. If you thought not amiss, said Stanfast, how happy am I! But if I be not as I should, I alone must bear it. That is true, said the other. But your fear doth further show me that things are right betwixt the Prince of Pilgrims and your soul, for he saith, Blessed is the man that feareth always. Well, but brother, I pray thee, tell us what was it that was the cause of thy being upon thy knees even now? Was it for that some special mercy laid upon thee, the need of prayer, or how? Why, we are, as you see, upon the enchanted ground, and as I was coming along I was musing with myself of what a dangerous road the road in this place was, and how many that had come even thus far on pilgrimage had here been stopped and been destroyed. I thought also of the manner of the death with which this place destroyeth men. Those that die here die of no violent, painful disease. The death which such die is not grievous to them, for he that goeth away in such a sleep begins that journey with desire and pleasure. Yea, such sink into the will of that disease. Then Mr. Honest, interrupting of him, said, Did you see the two men asleep in the arbor? Ay, ay, I saw heedless and too bold there, and for aught I know, there they will lie till they rot. But let me go on in my tale. As I was thus amusing, as I said, there was one in very pleasant attire, but old, who presented herself to me, and offered me three things, to wit, her body, her purse, and her bed. Now the truth is, I was both a-weary and sleepy, I am also as poor as an owlet, and that perhaps the witch knew. Well, I repulsed her once or twice, but she put by my repulses and smiled. Then I began to be angry, but she mattered that nothing at all. Then she made offers again and said, if I would be ruled by her, she would make me great and happy. For, said she, I am the mistress of the world, and men are made happy by me. Then I asked her name, and she told me it was Madame Bubble. This set me farther from her, but she still followed me with enticements. Then I betook me, as you saw, to my knees, and with hands lift up, and cries, I prayed to him that had said he would help. So, just as you came up, the gentlewoman went her way. Then I continue to give thanks for this, my great deliverance, for I verily believe she intended no good, but rather sought to make stop of me in my journey. Without doubt her designs were bad, but stay, now you talk of her, methinks I either have seen her, or have read some story of her. Perhaps you have done both. Madam Bubble, is she not a tall, comely dame, somewhat of a swarthy complexion? Right, you hit it. She is just such a one. Does she not speak very smoothly, and give you a smile at the end of a sentence? You fall right upon it again, for these are her very actions. Does she not wear a great purse by her side? And is not her hand often in it, fingering her money, as if that was her heart's delight? Tis just so. Had she stood by all this while, you could not more amply have set her forth before me, nor have better described her features. 
Then he that drew her picture was a good artist, and he that wrote of her said true. The woman is a witch, and it is by virtue of her witchcraft that this ground is enchanted. Whoever doth lay his head down in her lap, had as good lay it down upon that block over which the axe doth hang. And whoever lay their eyes upon her beauty are accounted the enemies of God. This is she that maintaineth in their splendour all those that are the enemies of pilgrims. Yea, this is she that hath bought off many a man from a pilgrim's life. She is a great gossiper. She is always, both she and her daughters, at one pilgrim's heels or other, now commanding and then preferring the excellences of this life. She is a bold and impudent creature. She will talk with any man. She always laugheth poor pilgrims to scorn, but highly commends the rich. If there be one cunning to get money in a place, she will speak well of him from house to house. She loveth banqueting and feasting mainly well. She is always at one full table or another. She has given it out in some places that she is a goddess, and therefore some do worship her. She has her times and open places of cheating and she will say and avow it, that none can show a good comparable to hers. She promiseth to dwell with children's children, and if they will but love her and make much of her, she will cast out of her purse gold like dust in some places and to some persons. She loves to be sought after, spoken well of, and to lie in the bosoms of men. She is never weary of praising her gifts, and she loves them most that think best of her. She will promise to some crowns and kingdoms, if they will but take her advice. Yet many hath she brought to the halter, and ten thousand times more to hell. Oh, what a mercy it is that I did resist her, for whither might she have drawn me? Whither? Nay, none but God knows whither. But in general, to be sure, she would have drawn thee into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and ruin. T'was she that set Absalom against his father, and Jeroboam against his master. T'was she that persuaded Judas to sell his lord, and that prevailed with Damas to forsake the godly pilgrim's life. None can tell of the mischief that she doth. She makes variance betwixt rulers and subjects, betwixt parents and children, betwixt neighbour and neighbour, betwixt a man and his wife, betwixt a man and himself, betwixt the flesh and the heart. Wherefore, good master, stand fast, be as your name is, and when you have done all, stand. At this course there was among the pilgrims a mixture of joy and trembling, but at length they break out, and sang, what danger is the pilgrim in? How many are his foes? How many ways there are to sin no living mortal knows? Some of the ditch shy are, yet can lie tumbling in the mire. Some, though they shun the frying pan, do leap into the fire. End of Part 2, Chapter 9 The Pilgrim's Progress, Part 2, Chapter 10 the Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan Part 2, Chapter 10 The Pilgrims at Home After this I beheld until they were come into the land of Beulah, where the sun shineth night and day. Here, because they were weary, they betook themselves a while to rest, and because this country was common for pilgrims, and because the orchards and vineyards that were here belonged to the king of the celestial country, Therefore they were permitted to make bold with any of his things. But a little while soon refreshed them here, for the bells did so ring, and the trumpets continually sound so melodiously, that they could not sleep, and yet they received as much refreshing as if they had slept their sleep never so soundly. Here also the noise of them that walked in the streets was, Our pilgrims are come to town. And another would answer, saying, and so many went over the water, and were let in at the golden gates to-day. They would cry again, There is now a legion of shining ones just come to the town, by which we know that there are more pilgrims upon the road, for here they come to wait for them, and comfort them after all their sorrow. 
Then the pilgrims got up and walked to and fro, but how their ears now filled with heavenly voices, and their eyes delighted with celestial visions! In this land they heard nothing, saw nothing, felt nothing, smelt nothing, tasted nothing that was offensive to their stomach or mind. Only when they tasted of the water of the river over which they were to go, they thought that it tasted a little bitterish to the palate, but it proved sweeter when it was down. In this place there was a record kept of the names of them that had been pilgrims of old, and a history of all the famous acts that they had done. It was here also much spoken of how the river to some had had its flowings, and what ebbings it had had while others have gone over. It has been in a manner dry for some, while it has overflowed its banks for others. In this place the children of the town would go into the king's gardens and gather nosegays for the pilgrims, and bring them to them with much affection. Here also grew camphor, with spikenard and saffron, calamus and cinnamon, and with all the trees of frankincense, myrrh, and aloes, with all chief spices. With these the pilgrims' chambers were perfumed while they stayed here, and with these their bodies anointed, to prepare them to go over the river when the time appointed was come. Now, while they lay there and waited for the good hour, there was a noise in the town that there was a messenger come from the celestial city with matter of great importance to one Christiana, the wife of Christian the pilgrim. So inquiry was made for her, and the house was found out where she was. So the messenger presented her with a letter, the contents whereof were, Hail, good woman! I bring thee tidings that the master calleth for thee, and expecteth that thou shouldst stand in his presence in clothes of everlasting life within these ten days. When he had read this letter to her, he gave her therewith a sure token that he was a true messenger, and was come to bid her make haste to be gone. The token was an arrow, with a point sharpened with love, let easily into her heart, which by degrees wrought so effectually with her, that at the time appointed, she must be gone. When Christiana saw that her time was come, and that she was the first of this company that was to go over, she called for Mr. Greatheart, her guide, and told him how matters were. So he told her he was heartily glad of the news, and could have been glad had the post come for him. Then she bid that he should give advice how all things should be prepared for her journey. So he told her, saying, Thus and thus it must be, and we that are left will accompany you to the riverside. Then she called for her children, and gave them her blessing, and told them that she yet read with comfort the mark that was set in their foreheads, and was glad to see them with her there, and that they had kept their garments so white. Lastly she gave to the poor that little she had, and commanded her sons and daughters to be ready against the messenger should come for them. When she had spoken these words to her guide and to her children, she called for Mr. Valiant for truth, and said unto him, Sir, you have in all places shown yourself true-hearted. Be faithful unto death, and my king will give you a crown of life. I would also entreat you to have an eye to my children, and if at any time you see them faint, speak comfortably to them. For my daughters, my sons' wives, they have been faithful, and a fulfilling of the promise upon them will be their end. But she gave Mr. Standfast a ring. Then she called for old Mr. Honest, and said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Then said he, I wish you a fair day when you set out for Mount Zion, and shall be glad to see that you go over the river dry shod. But she answered, Come wet, come dry, I long to be gone, for however the weather is in my journey, I shall have time enough when I come there to sit down and rest and dry me. Then came in that good man, Mr. Ready to halt, to see her. So she said to him, Thy travel hitherto has been with difficulty, but that will make thy rest the sweeter. But watch and be ready, for at an hour when you think not, the messenger may come. After him came in Mr. Despondency, and his daughter much afraid, to whom she said, you ought with thankfulness for ever to remember your deliverance from the hands of giant despair, and out of doubting castle. The effect of that mercy is that you are brought with safety hither. Be ye watchful, and cast away fear. Be sober, and hope to the end. Then she said to Mr. Feeble-Mind, 
Thou wast delivered from the mouth of giant Slaygood, that thou mightest live in the light of the living for ever, and see thy king with comfort. Only I advise thee to turn thee of thy aptness, to fear and doubt of his goodness, before he sends for thee, lest thou shouldst, when he comes, be forced to stand before him for that fault with blushing. Now the day drew on that Christiana must be gone. So the road was full of people to see her take her journey. But, behold, all the banks beyond the river were full of horses and chariots, which were come down from above to accompany her to the city gate. So she came forth and entered the river, with a beckon of farewell to those that followed her to the riverside. The last words that she was heard to say were, I come, Lord, to be with thee, and bless thee. So her children and friends returned to their place, for that those that waited for Christiana had carried her out of their sight. So she went and called, and entered in at the gates with all the tokens of joy that her husband Christian had done before her. At her departure her children wept, but Mr. Greatheart and Mr. Valiant played upon the well-tuned cymbal and harp for joy. So all departed to their respective places. In process of time there came a messenger to the town again, and his business was with Mr. Ready to halt. So he inquired him out, and said to him, I am come to thee from him whom thou hast loved and followed, though upon crutches, and my message is to tell thee that he expects thee at his table to sup with him in his kingdom the next day after Easter. Wherefore prepare thyself for this journey. Then he also gave him a token that he was a true messenger, saying, I have broken thy golden bowl and loosed thy silver cord. After this, Mr. Ready to Halt called for his fellow pilgrims and told them, saying, I am sent for, and God shall surely visit you also. So he desired Mr. Valiant to make his will, and because he had nothing to bequeath to them that should survive him but his crutches and his good wishes, therefore thus he said, These crutches I bequeath to my son that shall tread in my step with a hundred warm wishes that he may prove better than I have done. Then he thanked Mr. Goodhart for his conduct and kindness, and so addressed himself to his journey. When he came to the brink of the river, he said, Now I shall have no more need of these crutches, since yonder are chariots and horses for me to ride on. The last words he was heard to say were, Welcome, life. So he went his way. After this, Mr. Feeblemind had tidings brought him that the messenger sounded his horn at his chamber door. Then he came in and told him, saying, I am come to tell thee that thy master has need of thee, and that in a very little time thou must behold his face in brightness. And take this as a token of the truth of my message. Those that look out at the windows shall be darkened. Then Mr. Feeblemind called for his friends and told them what errand had been brought unto him and what token he had received of the truth of the message. Then he said, Since I have nothing to bequeath to any, to what purpose should I make a will? As for my feeble mind, that I will leave behind me, for that I shall have no need of in the place whither I go, nor is it worth bestowing upon the poorest pilgrim. Wherefore, when I am gone, I desire that you, Mr. Valiant, would bury it in a dunghill." This done, and the day being come on which he was to depart, he entered the river as the rest. His last words were, Hold out, faith and patience. So he went over to the other side. When days had many of them passed away, Mr. Despondency was sent for, for a messenger was come, and brought this message to him. Trembling man, these are to summon thee to be ready with thy king by the next Lord's Day to shout for joy for thy deliverance from all thy doubtings, and, said the messenger, that my message is true, take this for proof. So he gave the grasshopper to be a burden unto him. Now Mr. Despondency's daughter, whose name was Much Afraid, said when she heard what was done, that she would go with her father. Then Mr. Despondency said to his friends, My Seth and my daughter, you know what we have been and how troublesomely we have behaved ourselves in every company. My will and my daughter's is, that our discouraged feelings and slavish fears be by no man received from the day of our departure for ever, for I know that after my death they will offer themselves to others. 
for, to be plain with you, they are ghosts the which we entertained when we first began to the pilgrims, and could never shake them off after, and they will walk about and seek entertainment of the pilgrims, but for our sakes shut ye the doors upon them. When the time was come for them to depart, they went to the brink of the river. The last words of Mr. Despondency were, Farewell, night. Welcome, day. His daughter went through the river singing, but none could understand what she said. Then it came to pass, a while after, that there was a messenger in the town that inquired for Mr. Honest. So he came to his house where he was, and delivered to his hand these lines. Thou art commanded to be ready against this day seven night, to present thyself before thy lord at his father's house, and for a token that my message is true, all thy daughters of music shall be brought low. Then Mr. Honest called for his friends, and said unto them, I die, but shall make no will. As for my honesty, it shall go with me. Let them that come after me be told this. When the day that he was to be gone was come, he prepared himself to go over the river. Now the river at that time overflowed its banks in some places, but Mr. Honest in his lifetime had spoken to one good conscience to meet him there, the which also he did, and lent him his hand, and so helped him over. The last words of Mr. Honest were, Grace reigns! So he left the world. After this, it was noised abroad that Mr. Valiant for truth was taken with a summons by the same messenger as the other, and had this for a token that the summons was true, that his pitcher was broken at the fountain. When he understood it, he called for his friends, and told them of it. Then said he, I am going to my father's, and though with great difficulty I am got hither, yet now I do not repent me of all the trouble I have been at to arrive where I am. My sword I give to him that shall succeed me in my pilgrimage, and my courage and skill to him that can get it. My marks and scars I carry with me, to be a witness for me that I have fought his battles, who now will be my rewarder. When the day that he must go hence was come, many accompanied him to the riverside, into which, as he went, he said, Death, where is thy sting? And as he went down deeper, he said, Grave, where is thy victory? So he passed over, and all the trumpets sounded for him on the other side. Then there came forth a summons for Mr. Standfast. This Mr. Standfast was he whom the pilgrims found upon his knees in the enchanted ground, for the messenger brought it him open in his hands. The contents thereof were that he must prepare for a change of life, for his master was not willing that he should be so far from him any longer. At this Mr. Standfast was put into a muse. Nay, said the messenger, you need not doubt the truth of my message, for here is a token of the truth thereof. Thy wheel is broken at the cistern. Then he called to him Mr. Greatheart, who was their guide, and said unto him, Sir! Although it was not my hap to be much in your good company in the days of my pilgrimage, yet since the time I knew you, you have been profitable to me. When I came from home, I left behind me a wife and five small children. Let me entreat you at your return, for I know that you will go and return to your master's house, in hopes that you may yet be a conductor to more of the holy pilgrims, that you ascend to my family and let them be acquainted with all that hath or shall happen unto me. Tell them, moreover, of my happy arrival to this place, and of the present and late blessed condition that I am in. Tell them also of Christian, and Christiana his wife, and how she and her children came after her husband. Tell them also what a happy end she made, and whither she has gone. I have little or nothing to send to my family, unless it be my prayers and tears for them, of which it will suffice that you acquaint them, if peradventure they may prevail. When Mr. Standfast had thus set things in order, and the time being come for him to haste him away, he also went down to the river. Now there was a great calm at that time in the river, 
Wherefore, Mr. Stanfast, when he was about half-way in, stood a while, and talked to his companions that had waited upon him thither. And he said, This river has been a terror to many. Yea, the thoughts of it have also frighted me. But now, methinks, I stand easy. My foot is fixed upon that on which the feet of the priests that bear the Ark of the Covenant stood, while Israel went over Jordan. The waters, indeed, are to the palate bitter, and to the stomach cold. Yet the thought of what I am going to, and of the conduct that waits for me on the other side, doth lie as a glowing coal at my heart. I see myself now at the end of my journey. My toilsome days are ended. I am going to see that head which was crowned with thorns, and that face which was spit upon for me. I have formerly lived by hearsay and faith, but now I go where I shall live by sight, and shall be with him in whose company I delight myself. I have loved to hear my Lord spoken of, and wherever I have seen the print of his shoe in the earth, there have I coveted to set my foot too. His name has been to me as a perfume box, yea, sweeter than all sweet smells. His voice to me has been most sweet, and his countenance I have more desired than they that have most desired the light of the sun. His word I did use to gather for my food, and for medicine against my faintings. He has held me, and hath kept me from my sins. Yea, my steps hath he strengthened in his way. Now, while he was thus speaking, his countenance changed, his strong man bowed under him, and after he had said, Take me, for I come unto thee, he ceased to be seen of them. But glorious it was to see how the open region was filled with horses and chariots, with trumpeters and pipers, with singers and players on stringed instruments, to welcome the pilgrims as they went up, and followed one another in at the beautiful gates of the city. As for Christian's children, the four boys that Christiana brought with her, with their wives and children, I did not stay where I was till they were gone over. Also, since I came away, I heard one say that they were yet alive, and so would be for the help of the church in that place where they were for a time. Shall it be my lot to go that way again, I may give those that desire it an account of what I here am silent about. Meantime, I bid my reader adieu. End of Part 2, Chapter 10 End of Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan